on the migration question for after because it's totally regionally bound it's it's not in western europe there it's much higher as a concern but on average so, so we, we created a map here so th this is how we can answer the question and um, yeah no let's see but but i think migration is a topic that um, yes thank you we moeten zorgen dat we een doosje met rapporten mee krijgen, want het is niet bij ons bezorgd nog. Ja. Sorry. I saw that also some people from the European Commission were joining. I don't know if that's uh, regular <laughs> for your event. Yeah. because we were supposed to get a box with the mail, but it never happened. <laughs> uh, we got... We got uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, good, good morning, everybody. And... Uh, and welcome to our publication about middle class concerns and European challenges. Um, thank you for all, uh, all coming, especially I have to say our friends from Sweden. It was a good uh, coincidence that, uh, that you were able to come here. It's, uh, you know, our friends from Moderate uh, developing and uh, discussing about politics. I think it's kind of excellent that you are here to discuss the issue at hand. So, what have we done in the, in the Martin Center? Uh, basically, next year we have a European elections and there will be a lot of discussion about topics, preferences, tendencies, even, even feelings. And uh, our approach for, for this discussion has been that it's better to have that discussion having some facts. So we are already, actually this study, what we are going to, uh, we are going to present now, which concerns all EU member states, 20, 27, is actually the second part. We already, some, uh, a little bit more than half a year ago, published the first, first draw, first uh, study, which, which, uh, of which the current study is, is the continuation of also, you know, because we wanted to be, you know, sure that the topics and the questions and the whole setting is, is good. After the success of the first paper, which is still available online, we, we are launching this one. And, and this is actually part of uh, the tour, which we are doing all around Europe, presenting the study and this discussion. Also, we are, uh, you know, handling the data and have country-specific uh, uh, presentations. Normally, one uh, opening, uh, you know, publication launch does not refer so much of to, the, uh, to the content, um, but as there was some mentioning already in the, in the invitation, I maybe I, I give some uh, some glimpse. Um, European debate and people's preferences have had quite dramatic change. Uh, during the past one or two, three years. Also, we could see it between our first study and uh, second uh, study. The main topics, you know, economic concerns and the security are not coming as a surprise. Um, po Post-COVID situation or in Ukraine, energy crisis and inflation have, have had very deep impact on, on how people see their future perspectives. And of course, war in Ukraine uh, uh, has almost, you know, doubled down, doubled that, uh, that uh, impact. But there are other topics which are very much under the surface and, and ready to come, uh, come up or pump up if the, those topics are triggered in the public discussion. But I leave that cliffhanger for the, for the discussion. 
So really, uh, so this is the starting point. This is our uh, the discussion. Based on this discussion, this study, we will not only not only participate in the discussion in EU different EU member states about the topics and, and, and preferences for the European elections, but also, of course, the policy proposals and what is acceptable and what is not. We are focused uh, on the middle class. And to conclude, we are focused on the middle class, of course, because that's the main segment of, of of not only the population but especially close to the to the you know the, the ideological base of uh, center right and the European People's Party of which the Foundation Martin Center is of. But with this, um, uh, welcome, welcome you all, also the online viewers. Happy to have you uh, here. And I keep it uh, short. I would just thank you, the panelists, for coming. And I pass the word to Federico Rejo, who has been managing this, uh, this uh, project and will moderate the discussion and debate. And, and I guess, firstly, introduces the, the panelists. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. And Federico, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tommy, for this helpful introduction. Uh, welcome to you all also from me. Um, well, I am here in a slightly dissociated capacity uh, because I am both uh, one of the authors and the Martin Center editor of the paper, but I'm also moderating this debate. So I will mostly be a moderator, but I will occasionally also step in to contribute some, to make some substantive contributions if needed. Um, well, Tommy has already introduced the, the topic, so I don't need to spend too many words on this. I can only tell you it was, it's a big study covering all the 27 member states, uh, and it was a rather demanding one. It was long in the making, about one year and a half from the early conceptualization to the final uh, sort of delivery. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very challenging subject, starting from the very basic issue, which is uh, how do you define uh, the middle class. What is a class in our very fragmented, you know, social landscapes today? And Martin will will explain how we try to address that very difficult methodological uh, question. We decided to to still, uh, let's say, uh, stick to the topic, insist on the topic, essentially for three reasons. And we can start projecting. I think the the PowerPoint presentation. And while they do, uh, yeah, we can move to the third, second or third slide already. So why, why did we do this? I mean, the first reason is that uh, we felt that something is happening on the ground. I mean, we have been discussing a sense of malaise uh, of the middle classes now for quite a while. There have been important reports, for example, one prominent from the OECD and one of the people at the table, one of our speakers, Anthony Gooch here, uh, was involved in the production of that report, uh, that have shown that in the last 15 years of successive crisis, there is a perception and probably a reality of a squeezed middle that is, um, that is experiencing financial and economic distress. Uh, we wanted to approach the topic for the first time from a center-right perspective, from the perspective of a foundation that is affiliated to to the European People's Party and, that, and therefore as a center-right uh, sensitivity. Uh, the, the political implications are also very obvious. I mean, this, it's an economic and social issue on the surface, but of course it has a direct bearing on the democratic process because as we know, the stability of democracy depends on, um, on prosperous middle classes. And we indeed saw in the last 15 years uh, increasing support for anti-establishment populist parties as a result of the, um, of the deterioration of middle class prospects. And then the final maybe reason is that there is a, um, a long standing belief, I think, in center right parties, Christian Democrats, conservative parties, that uh, the middle class is the core constituency of, this, uh, of, of the center right. And so uh, it was interesting for us to understand to what extent that is still so, is it still true? And if not, what, what should be done to remedy that? And we can move to the next slide. So the key questions, um, um, well, we wanted to map out 
the challenges, the concerns, the perceptions, the aspirations of the middle classes at the pan-European level, all over Europe, as I said, we cover all member states. I think one feature of the, of the study is that uh, it, it does cover economic and social issues, and indeed, um, it confirms that the economy is at the heart of the middle class problem. Uh, but we felt that too many middle class studies tend to just narrowly focus on these issues. Well, uh, economic and social issues have all sorts of spillovers in other policy areas. And so I think it's one of the few, I mean, one of the few, very few, I would say you can count them, like maybe a couple of others. There are uh, middle class studies who go beyond economic and social issues to also include issues of trust, issues of security, uh, and reflect on how they have a bearing on the middle class problem. So that's the first set of questions. The second set of questions is, what are the implications of all this for center-right parties? So that's as a way of introduction. I will now uh, pass the floor to uh, Martai, who is also a co-author of the study, and he will give you an introduction to the main findings uh, of the, of the uh, project. Martin is a co-founder and research director at Glocalities. We partner with Glocalities, which is essentially an international research agency focusing on values-based uh, research. He has more than 25 years' experience in researching these issues. So I think he can give you a very good overview. And then we will, we will have a, a, a pan of debate and also an exchange with all of you. Uh, and so I take this chance to introduce also the other two speakers, which are to my uh, left, Anthony Gooch. Uh, who is here, I was mentioning his role in producing the OECD report on the middle classes. He has been, uh, he was 15 years a director at the OECD. Uh, before that, he was a senior commission official. He advised Pascal Lamy. He worked mostly on international trade. And then uh, Rosa Maria Bitetti, who is a lecturer. She has a double hat. She is an academic working at uh, Lewis University in Rome on social science and public policy. But she's also an economist at the OECD. So, uh, after, with, with that said, I pass the floor to Martin for his uh, overview of the study. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Federico, and for the Martin Center to do this study together in cooperation. Um, we have been specialized uh, already for several decades in looking at the world in a 360 degree view, um, more holistic because if you look at values, you see the interconnectedness of things and also the relation with the economy. So about the localities research we did um, together with Martin Center and Panos Papadongonas, my colleague there, he uh, is also co-author of this study. And so if there are any questions specifically about the data later on or you want to look into a specific country, we can do that. Um, we did the field work in March and April this year in all EU countries. <clears throat> it is an extensive online uh, survey with various parts. It's quite uh, lively and diverse also for the respondents because it goes into the values of people, the economic uh, circumstances, uh, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, trends and all the topics that uh, Federico already mentioned. Um, we did it based on quota sampling, so based on census figures in each country uh, with respect to age, gender, education and region, we set up a quota and accordingly the respondents filled out the, uh, the questionnaire so we have balanced samples and we surveyed more than uh, 15,000 respondents uh, across the EU and here you see the numbers. I will go through it quite quickly, um, so enjoy the ride I would say. So I will first um, start with the definition that we use for uh, looking at the middle class because you can take a definition based on occupation, for example, or based on income, or based on living area. Uh, there are many ways of researching classes, uh, but we came to a solution that's a bit different, but that correlates with all these uh, um, categorizations really well. Financial security, fear of falling, security concerns, thinking about the future of Europe, and solutions and the role of the centre-right, those are the topics that we will cover. So first, looking at the European middle classes. And here you see ladders, uh, and we use actually a ladder approach. A ladder can also be an elevator. We discussed it uh, earlier, and this provides people also with hope for the future. So this is at the heart of the discussion of the, the future. 
Um, this is the question that we use at the end. Uh, after long discussions, we, we chose this to test it out, and it worked actually very well with the data. Um, imagine that this letter is a picture of how your country is set up. This is what the response was shown. At the top of the ladder, you have people who have the most money, the highest amount of schooling, the best jobs, the most respect. At the bottom, you have people who have the least money, little or no education, no jobs, or jobs that no one wants, and the least respect. Now think about your family, because classes is very much related to generations. Uh, can you tell us where you think your family would be on that ladder at the moment? And then you could choose from 1 to 10. And these are the outcomes. So we saw that there's, of course, a normal distribution in these answers. And then you have the group that scores 4 to 7, and that together is already more than half of the population, clearly more. And within this group, the people who give a six or a five uh, on this ladder are four in ten people in Europe. But then there's also a group that we call the lower middle class. It's 11 percent. It's four. And the upper middle class, seven. Because we did not want to have a determinating uh, definition, uh, but a more fluid definition. So we speak about the middle classes because there are various angles you can take for doing these analyses. Then you have 14% in the upper class and 13% in the lower class. And here you see, based on standardized scores, some of the uh, values behind those people. So for the um, middle class, which is the line in green, that's quite average on these items, uh, being pessimistic about the future. However, for the lower classes is much more outstanding, feeling let down by society as well. Very much a topic that resonates with the lower classes. If we look at calling for smaller income differences, exactly the same, which is also natural. Um, the higher classes, however, are more likely to have interest in politics, participate. Um, consider life as being easy. Uh, they are more in, in the flow. They believe more often that change often results in improvements. Uh, so here you see already some cleavages, but the middle class, of course, is the largest group, is, uh, is, is the middle ground. So this brings us also to the pyramid of Maslow. It's like a hierarchy of needs. And when we went through the results, it was very clear that um, this pyramid explains a lot. So if you look at the upper class, European middle classes and lower classes, there are specific needs, specific aspirations that resonate with these classes. But of course, you need security. You need the basic uh, psych physiological needs to be uh, fulfilled. Yeah, you need food, you need shelter. Uh, to be able to self-actualize, hey, you first need this, safety, hey, also with regard to hey, the geopolitical tensions that there are. That, that's very important, love, belonging, esteem. Um, and then we see that in the European middle classes, the aspiration for the next five years that they more often express than others is higher income, higher salaries, having my finances under control. Uh, so the economy is so important. People in the upper class are able to reflect on their life much more. They are also a bit more relaxed. They, they want to have clearer goals in life, for example. They, they want to focus on having a good career. And this is something that we often tend to forget. Uh, because people who are working in education or in EU policy circles are often more higher in the pyramid of Maslow position themselves. So this is um, a universal, of course, uh, aspiration is being healthy. So there is a profound um, fear of falling, also present amongst the uh, European middle classes. So here you see a ranking of the topics of concerns 
that, um, that people express. Cost of living is expressed as a major concern by half of the respondents, followed by hunger and poverty, crime and safety, environment, climate change, and so it goes uh, down until 14% uh, inequality. So cost of living is an important topic, and it's even higher scoring amongst the lower middle class and the lower classes, just like uh, topics as income and economy, um, unemployment. So more than half of the European population say that they struggle to get by. So uh, there, there are four uh, categories. I'm finding it difficult to get by. It's for 15%. I'm just getting by 40%. These people taken together is already more than half of the European population. I'm doing okay, 40%. Uh, living very comfortably is only a small group. And amongst the lower middle class, of course, this feeling of I'm just getting by, I'm struggling, is, is very profound. There is much more pessimism also amongst the lower uh, middle class. So here we see um, a question on how people think their country will evolve in the near future on various topics. Then you see, if you ask about people's standards of living in general, 71% uh, um, of the lower class say, well, things will get worse. So there is pessimism. Of the lower middle class, it's 63%, still clearly more than half. Of the upper middle class, it's 39%. So you see this almost linear correlation. The same goes for mental public health, mental health crisis. It's, it's clearly class-related. Um, feelings about social security and pensions, the same. Trust in government, the same. The same pattern, trust in the state. So we are coping here with a very profound, deep problem and crisis that we need to define answers to. And this spills over to um, opinions on the war in Ukraine. So we ask people some, some uh, statements, uh, and you see the same pattern. So I'm worried about the economic consequences of my, for my country of the war in Ukraine. Amongst the lower middle class is 72%. Amongst the upper class, it's 64, 58%. I'm worried about the economic consequences for myself. It's even more discriminating. 65% of the lower middle class agree to this statement. There's only a very small group who disagrees. And the upper class, it's only half of them. So these topics are clearly interrelated. Talking about the war in Ukraine, what we also looked at is trust in Russia, which is generally, of course, very low in Europe. But in some countries, it is quite uh, some minorities that um, express more trust in Russia than in other countries, which is the case in Slovakia. We already know what's happening there, Bulgaria and Greece. And this is correlated with some other opinions on the war in Ukraine. So the EU should do more to protect Ukraine and the Ukrainians. Uh, on average, it's around 46% who agree to this. But here you see that in uh, Northeast Europe, these uh, people from these countries are much more likely to agree with this statement than in Southeast Europe. So here you see already some cleavages. Um, also on the transatlantic relation, we see the same patterns. The European Union and the United States of America should be close allies and act together on the international scene to counter authoritarian powers like China and Russia you again see that in Southeast Europe, uh, people are less likely to agree to this statement. And this is partly due to cultural differences, to history, the Russian brother against the fight uh, against the Ottomans really long time ago, uh, but also the link with Orthodox uh, religion, but it is there. So if we look at the future, I'm going quite fast, of course, to leave room for discussion, we ask people how they envision the future of Europe. 
and people are longing for more cooperation and safety, solidarity, freedom, stability, justice. So going back to the roots of why the European Union was established, that is a longing of people for the future. Although we know that um, some people are also really disappointed and, uh, uh, in Europe and the opinions about Europe do really vary, the longing for the future, the ideals of Europe, are still alive and can be built upon and related to. So let's go to solutions. So in the financial realm, we ask people which of the proposed solutions would help you feel more, more financially secure. Lower taxes on my income from work. So work should pay off for people. That is the highest scoring one. More affordable housing. So this has to do with the pyramid of Maslow and then the base and the middle of it. And that's so important. People need stability. They need to be able to work and um, that pays off and that provides them with money for their family, for their, um, their future. Better paid jobs for people with my educational level. And then lower interest rates for loans, for example, that is less of a priority. What we also see is that only a minority is willing to pay higher taxes for better public services. This differs per country. What is really interesting that in a country like Greece, people are more likely to agree. And so better public services are, are, are important, but how this is being paid for, those uh, are topics that uh, uh, opinions are divided upon. The relationship with trust. EU trust is relatively high. It's much higher than trust in national governments. Trust in national government is at 33% on average. Trust in the European Union is at 50% on average. We see the same in our global research that we do with respect to the United Nations. People also project a lot of trust into the United Nations. And that has to do also with the word united. And there's a unity of mankind. And that people project hope into it. So that's a possible vehicle that can bring people together again. The same goes for the European Union. But again, there's a risk of the middle um, and the lower middle class to drift away on those trust issues. Because trust in the EU amongst the upper class is 59%, but amongst the lower middle class, which is a core constituent of um, center-right parties, it's 46%. So there's quite a cleavage there. Um, but what is interesting is that trust in ordinary people is quite high. And this resonates with Christian democratic uh, ideology, where civil society is one of the pillars. And in the pyramid of Maslow, at the mid and the bottom end, there are different economic principles that are central, that people are longing for. This is not so much about competition or standing out, but it's more about solidarity and reciprocity. And this is also the reason why civil society is so important and the family is so important, because those are based on principles as, uh, as solidarity and reciprocity. And that's what a lot of people are longing for. Um, there are differing views on center-right values. We have tested quite a set. Um, um, one of the central um, views that comes out highest is that illegal migration from outside the EU must be limited and external EU borders must be protected. That is clearly uh, and there the, the classes are not really divided on this topic. This is a, a priority. The second one, respect for rule of law, separation of powers is essential for a well-functioning society. One of the pillars of the European Union, the rule of law, there's a lot of support there. I believe a social market economy based on freedom, responsibility and fairness is best for our society. 
And here you also see, again, this principle of reciprocity um, at the heart. Then you see that on the transatlantic uh, relations, views are a bit more divided. Um, on European integration, also, views are more divided. Um, and people slip towards the negative end on topics such as the EU should be more open to legal migration. And, interestingly enough, Christianity and Christian values are the basis of my thinking. It's, is, is not as profound as um, the rule of law and the social market economy. So I'm going to uh, close. Um, what we did with this holistic approach, we looked at various value segment, segments in Europe. And there are profound differences that are highly explanatory for developments within Europe that you see every day. So there is a group of cosmopolitan creatives on the right-hand side, on the top of the model, freedom and exploration oriented. On the left-hand side, at the bottom, you have conservatives, traditionalists, at 22%. There are also challengers, achievers. But what is highly instructive is that after 2004, the countries that joined the EU have a relatively different values composition. So the group of traditionalists has grown since then. So the founding countries of the EU had less traditionalists than the countries that joined the EU later. And the group of creatives, cosmopolitan creatives, was more prominent than it is at this moment. And we know that in the Brussels bubble, there are also a lot of creatives. So it is sometimes hard to connect with regions in Europe that have more traditionalist values. And this lens of values is, is explanatory. Um, because here you see the map. Traditionalists are more often present in countries such as Bulgaria, Romania, Greece. And you, you see it at the eastern border and less present in Northwest Europe. Um, so, so this is the cleavage that you see play out for a lot. Creatives, on the other hand, uh, cosmopolitan, open-minded, um, open to uh, unmarried couples living together, a gay mar a marriage, for example, that's more, uh, those people are more present in, in Northern Europe, in Western Europe, in Southwest Europe, that's where the, yeah, the opinions on these topics are, are different. And we need to understand this more deeply to be able to connect with people in Central and Eastern Europe and also on the topics of trust in Russia, in Southeast Europe. Because it's not the case that these people would like to become part of Russia, not at all. They're, they're, they are fed up with corruption, for example. So th there are ideals of Europe that do resonate with them. But we need to be very precise in that. So let's go back to Federico for the summary and recommendations. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. For the sake of time, I will do it from here, if you don't mind. Just a very fast summary and some recommendations that we felt are in order before giving the floor to the two discussants. Uh, first of all, I mean, you have understood there is a general crisis of insecurity and fear of falling behind in Europe's middle classes. As you have seen, more than half of Europe's middle classes are just getting by financially. They declare that they are just getting by, so they're experiencing some degree of financial distress. Um, they resent, I mean, the, the cost of living crisis and the inflation crisis, they, the, it tops their sort of agenda of key concerns. Interestingly, even the geopolitical challenges are often interpreted through the prism of their impact on their economic status, which is interesting in the way that, I mean, even the war in Ukraine, or I suspect what's going on now in the Middle East, if we attested that the, the survey was done before, uh, is still perceived through the prism of the impact that it has on their financial and economic um, position. Uh, so a relatively gloomy picture from this point of view. Also, if you consider that people expect that things will get worse in uh, many policy areas, 
there is an element of resilience, though. We couldn't display this in the, uh, in the slides, but it's present in the paper. Uh, people have faith that negative developments in the economic field can be reversed through effective intelligent policy action. The, uh, the trust crisis in the political parties, institutions, and the democratic process is much, deeply, much more deep. So people there uh, seem to be rather negative and pessimistic about the possibility to even reverse the crisis. So that's the first area of conclusions. We can move to the next slide. Uh, despite the relatively gloomy picture, we saw some opportunities for action by both the EU and the center right. Uh, the EU, because as Martijn explained, the, interestingly, the EU is much more trusted than national governments and parliaments. This is not, we're not the first one to detect this. And this uh, fact, it's everybody's guess why that is so, maybe because the EU simply does not act a lot in these areas and therefore does not fail a lot, contrary to, so this is one interpretation, but I think whatever is the interpretation, uh, there is scope for stepping up EU action and there is a sort of uh, an element of credit that citizens have towards the EU that can be harnessed politically. Uh, second aspect that uh, is interesting, I think, this high trust in civil society, in ordinary people. I think it's very much a feature of our time. Um, um, it has, I would say, a positive side and a negative side, or a positive potential and a negative potential. The positive potential is a potential for active citizenry and revitalizing the democratic process through civil society activism. The negative potential, I think, is populism. It's the attitude that says, we don't trust the elites, we have had enough of experts, we trust ordinary people to take control. Uh, and so I think which one of these two potentials is realized depends very much also on the actorship of political parties. And that's why one of the recommendations that we gave is for stronger EU political parties and a stronger transnational EU democracy, because we feel there is a need to connect this trust in ordinary people with trust in the EU through adequate, you know, an adequate democratic infrastructure, which is, which is developing, but is still lacking. And finally, I think there, there is optimism for the way in which center-right policies and values resonate still with Europe's middle classes. Going back to our initial question, is, the, is this still a core constituency of the center-right? Things like the social market economy, uh, strong rule of law, regulated immigration. But if you look at the correlation, you will see that the, the lower middle classes are much less aligned uh, than the middle classes and the upper middle classes. So here there is some work to do for center-right decision makers to reconnect with the lower middle classes. And then final, very final point, uh, this is an issue that we have also made, I mean, uh, elucidated in the previous paper, the one that Tommy was mentioning. Um, we still probably do not take values differences seriously enough when crafting EU policies. I mean, these, these differences, even in the East, you know, between the Northeast and the Southeast are particularly striking, you know, in the context of the uh, Ukraine war. Uh, the way in which, you know, values, middle class issues and geopolitical concerns, for example, interact in defining different attitudes towards Russia. Uh, this is an aspect, but also the, the, the more sort of family, uh, identity, politics issue that Martijn was mentioning, I think we still have to find the balance in European decision making that really enables, you know, taking diversity seriously and enabling a fair amount of internal differentiation to maintain middle class cohesion and political cohesion and EU support more generally. So that's roughly our conclusions. And with that, we end this first part of presenting the findings. And I suggest now that we uh, go to our discussions. And after they take the floor, I mean, we, we don't have a huge amount of time. So I, su I suggest that if some of you want to take the floor, you can already start thinking about comments, questions after our discussion speak. Um, so I suggest that I give the floor to maybe Anthony first and then uh, Rosa Maria, if you agree. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much, Federico, and thanks very much for the invitation to uh, uh, comment here. I was really lucky in the wonderful surroundings of Malta to attend uh, the Centre's thinking. It was my baptism, and um, in that context, um, we were given a, a sneak preview of uh, what was shown today. Um, and I, I want to kick off perhaps by uh, underlining the importance of the segment that we are looking at, because in many senses, uh, the middle class, um, whether it's lower, middle, or upper, 
And most people, by the way, want to be part of the middle class. We need to know that. Some people who are not in it from below strive, and some people who are above don't want people to know they're above, and so they say that they're, they're, they're in it. So it's very important to bear in mind that this is what most people aspire to. It's, it's the bedrock of a well-functioning, um, advanced society and, and, uh, and economy uh, that's built on democracy and, and market economy principles. Um, and, and healthy middle classes, they underpin uh, successful economies because they're the ones who do most of the consuming. They're the ones um, who pay most of the tax. Let's remember that tax-taking countries, you're talking about two-thirds of it, is, uh, or, or maybe a little bit less, that is coming from middle classes. And they're also those who benefit mostly from what the state then provides back in terms of uh, uh, benefits in different ways. But they have a big demand for education, for health, and for housing. And I think that's super interesting when you then look at the issues uh, of concern. They're also the ones who are going to be most keen to see high quality public services in those domains that I just cited. Um, and um, as Federico said, uh, uh, when, when I was at the OECD, we looked at this issue of the squeezed middle back in 2018, um, because we, we were able to, to detect that in the previous 20 years, uh, the middle class had actually shrunk. Uh, so it had and was getting uh, um, smaller. And this coincided at the time, at the time already, with a rise in the cost of living um, that, as you can imagine, has only been exacerbated by what we talk about now. Because now we explicitly talk about a cost of living crisis, and we did not do that in the same way, I would say, back in 2018. I mean, we were still getting over the financial crisis, et cetera, and also um, uh, other things were occupying our minds, uh, like Brexit and um, changes in the United States that were had big ramifications uh, around the, the world. Um, when you look at... Uh, the challenges in certain areas like housing, and, and housing is central to being middle class. Owning your own home is central to being middle class. House prices have risen, say, three times uh, the level of inflation. And I think many of us and many of you will know in urban areas in many different parts of the EU, um, people have been priced out of living uh, in the places that they were living in and in, in the cities that they were uh, living in. Uh, together with that, an absence of social mobility, and it's connected. Um, because where you live, what education you get, how healthy you are, all of these elements are so, sort of self-fulfilling. Um, and uh, we were able to identify that it's really damning. Um, it, it would take four or five generations for a child born into a low-income uh, segment to actually get up into a median income segment. And that four or five generations is about 150 years. So think about that in terms of the likelihood. And the problem is with the elevators. Uh, the elevators of education, health, etc., they are very slow for certain people and they're very fast for other people. And it's like inflation. So if, even if you're going up a little bit, if inflation's there, you're not. In relative terms, you're falling uh, away. Um, and a another fascinating element is also when you aggregate the income of middle class households, uh, the, it used to be four times that of the upper income households, proportionately. Already in 2019, it was less than three times that. So you see, these are, this is tangible stuff. So the, the squeezing uh, has really taken place. And I think that what this study does is it's fan, uh, fantastic then to have a sort of finger on the pulse of the situation in Europe in, in so many ways and how this is playing out. Um, inflation, very uh, critical uh, issue. Cost of living crisis driven by pre-existing political tensions. Let's remember that those tensions were already there in 2016, US-China, that then went into EU-China, uh, etc. The sense of unfairness that's uh, pointed to um, also, I think, in this, uh, um, in this study, um, I think that was a, a very important factor in the vote in the United Kingdom uh, in 2016. Um, the impact of the pandemic, um, the fracturing of supply chains, and as though we didn't have enough on our plates, suddenly uh, war is back. And I thought we'd left war behind, hadn't we? 
And here we are with a very uncomfortable situation. And war touches on those two elements of Maslow's pyramid that well-to-do Europeans and people in the EU thought they didn't have to worry about anymore, uh, which were their physiological needs, things like food and energy to keep themselves warm. And suddenly those two issues are live issues for everyone and certainly for middle classes. Uh, take all that together, you get big issues around trust um, and the inflation problem that we have now that's going to exacerbate it. Now, uh, what now? So this, I'm going to come in a little bit with some of the, the thoughts uh, linked to solutions, but also very, very closely linked to, to EU itself. Who is deemed to be trusted and able to do something about this? So I think there, there's a, a really interesting, the, the findings around the European Union being trusted are great. The challenge comes when you then juxtapose how people see the EU um, in terms of solving the problems in society. And that's on page 41 of the study. And so if you contrast the level of trust in the EU inherently with the trust in their ability to do something about the problems, it falls down. Um, why is that? Uh, now let me uh, chuck in uh, some thoughts uh, on, uh, on, on, that, on that. I think that there are elements that uh, relate to what the EU is allowed to do. The EU is not allowed to do a lot of things. Okay, so let's, let's be clear on that. Everyone who thinks the EU does everything and controls everything, no. The EU is told to stay out of a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and the other element, of course, is the means that the EU has to do what people expect it to do. And that's super important because there are many things that the EU does that then it doesn't actually have the resource to follow up, to implement and to enforce. And uh, we human beings need that because we tend to not be brilliant about doing the things that we've committed to doing. Uh, and, and I think that that is a big challenge uh, in order to uh, uh, do something about that. And of course the EU suffers from issues around um, the perception of psychological distance, because it's far away somehow, although it isn't really. I don't know how far our Swedish friends think that they've had to come uh, to be here in Brussels today, if that's you know, like traveling to India, not really. Um, and um, the, the means, as I said, we touch upon uh, uh, being allowed to do things, competence there, I'd say, and uh, resources. Uh, my, I'm gonna come back on that uh, very, uh, very quickly. Um, but look in the last, just the last few years, the EU has delivered um, to change narratives and perceptions, I think in a whole host of areas. Number one, pandemic. If someone had told me back in the days when I was working for the commission that uh, the commission would be asked to do public procurement for a vaccine for the whole of the EU to save it against a pandemic that was killing thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, I would never have believed you in a million years. No way. How, how is it possible to give the EU? And suddenly everyone's going, yeah, God, I don't want to do it. Shit. Uh, let's see who I can find to do that. So the EU delivered on that on two levels. Number one, it delivered on it um, logistically, it delivered on it in price. The price that the EU negotiated relative to, just take a look at what Israel paid or take a look at what the United Kingdom paid and compare what with the deal the EU got. Second thing, the European Medicines Evaluation Agency. Everybody waited for the European Medicines Evaluation Agency to say the vaccine is fine. There was not one national regulator in the EU that said, no, 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 I don't, I'm not waiting. They could have, they could have done. They could have cracked on. Um, that wasn't an option for the United Kingdom. So they had to roll the dice and say, well, I've got nothing to lose, so I might as well get the vaccine out there quickly. And, you know, fortunately, there weren't, there weren't side effects there, but imagine if there had been. Second element, oversight of big banks. Who does the oversight of big banks now? It's not national, it's the ECB, right? We had the financial crisis, enough. Now we take it up uh, a level. Uh, who's done the early implementation on tax, which is an issue that people care about? Base erosion and profit shifting that the OECD developed. Uh, the taxation uh, properly, you know, where you actually uh, generate uh, your income and revenue. It's the EU that have been first out of the blocks to implement those uh, provisions from the G20 and OECD. The next generation EU programme, and uh, recently in defence and security, uh, the European Peace Facility to facilitate procurement to uh, the Ukraine. Now I think there's a huge uh, opportunity uh, it's an opportunity on the domestic side. It's not easy uh, there on things like housing and education because they are very much national, uh, uh, even regional and local competence. 
Um, but there's a, a, a statistic that I saw recently in an article in the FT that was a little bit worrying. And when you look at um, things like the tackling of unfairness, um, state aids have gone through uh, the roof uh, in, uh, in recent years. So state aid ex expenditure um, between 2015 and 2021 went up from about 100 billion euros to over 330 billion. But then it, be, be just between March of 22 and August of 23, a far, a far smaller time, time frame, um, it went up to over 700 billion. Um, so state aids have gone through the roof. The other dirty little secret there is that they haven't gone to everybody. 50% of state aids have gone to two countries. And I will let you guess who they are. They're known as the, the, mo the motor. Um, so there is certainly stuff that can be done on, on unfairness. Secondly, on tackling uh, the cost of uh, living, a lot of issues there uh, linked to energy uh, that the EU is working on right now. Also, I'd say that there's scope uh, to work on the anxiety around jobs and the future. Programs on vocational, educational training, um, engaging closely with business uh, on this stuff, access to adult learning. These are European, these are programs that could be managed at a, at a European level and done at a European level. And also something really important, which is linking entitlements to individuals and allowing those individuals to be able to take them with them around Europe as well. The training and the benefit, uh, you know, rucksacks uh, that they could have. Th these are spaces that could be worked on. Um, and the last area, I think, is on, on the external side. Um, surely, with, with the re-emergence re of war, the interest on the part of European citizenry on what can be done collectively around security, a united Europe on security that takes you into the military, that takes you into the defense. Perhaps an issue that has always been a bit taboo is one that now is ripe uh, to be looked at. On means, I think that the EU is trusted. It needs to be given competence uh, and also to be able to deliver. It needs to work on productivity, which I think would be uh, hugely increased, for example, if the single market were actually to happen and to be um, completed properly, and that takes enforcement. Um, and I think there is no way, realistically, in this sort of new framework, that you can do that with just over 1% of the GDP of the European Union uh, devoted to it. So this isn't about having more money. It's about who you give the money to to do the things that are needed to be done now. And I think that there's probably an inexorable uh, realization that you're going to have to, in a sense, put your money uh, where your mouth uh, is there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anthony, particularly because you already entered the issue of the policy conclusions that we can draw from the report and the potential for EU action that is implied in the, in the findings. Um, Rosa Maria, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you for having me and for giving me the hard task of commenting on a study I really liked, because it's easier when you don't like them. So I think it fills uh, an important gap, an important scope of working on self-perception and self-definition of the middle class, because we already have a lot of literature on what is actually happening with numbers and the wonderful research from the OECD, if I may be partial about it, but uh, uh, tell us, and also we know uh, that about it's not only important the data and the numbers, but also the stories that people tell themselves and how they see their uh, economic situation because that affects their political demands and their political requests and votes in the end. And the trouble is, and I was finally, I was trying, I'm a policy person. I do policy. But I was talking with this with a politics person, a former friend of mine who is now a political strategist to a, an Italian party. And he said, no, no, no. We, and I was discussing this study. And he was, but there are faster way. You just go on the web and check web sentiment and what's trending. And I was, yes, that's a certainly faster and certainly cheaper way of checking the pulse of the middle class. It's not a more effective. because. You cannot ask people what's the problem or what's the solution, because there is very deep and well-rounded research on political ignorance, which is a shocking and widespread phenomenon everywhere. Most European citizens have no idea of what the EU can do and member states can do. They have no idea of even roughly the percentage of share of our money that goes into social security or pension or healthcare or foreign aid. Like most of uh, European citizens and Americans too, these researchers are 
homogeneous all around the world, think that you could actually solve crisis by reducing foreign aid, which is a tiny percentage of the budget everywhere. And this is something I always love to say. In 1964, only a tiny minority of Americans knew that the, US, uh, the Russia, USS, was not part of the North Atlantic Treaty Strategy, NATO which is the same organization made to defeat them after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we cannot be just Twitter politicians and pretend to set a long-term fruitful agenda to solve real problems of the middle class just by relying on the sentiment that people show up on that. Because people don't know what's what are the best solutions, and they are, even have trouble in defining problems. What, what do they know? It's what are their problems the problems in their life. So this, I think this is, was very effective in showing uh, and asking the right question. What follows up? Follows up that you clearly have a squeezed middle class with a broken social elevator to use keywords already used. But what strongly emerged is that it's a stagnant middle class, more worried about protecting what they have, fear of falling down, than projected in the future. And I think this is a major uh, idea, idealization problem. And it comes also from policy solution. Again, uh, mm, data shows that the rate of reforms uh, in terms of market dynamism are slowing down. Uh, less and less countries, and Europe, which used to be the lighthouse of economic reforms in the goal of market unification, but creating a strong and uh, dynamic and interconnected uh, over European economy, it's focusing less on those issues. And this might not be on top of preoccupation of people surveyed, uh, but if you see increased regulation of professional services, uh, it means that my daughter will find it harder to get, enter a typical middle class occupation. Uh, if you find that education is stagnant, it might mean that current teachers uh, are uh, looking for more secure jobs, uh, but my, my daughter will find it harder to access better education unless I can supply with further information. So what kind of middle classes are we trying to help and what aligns most uh, with the val traditional values of the center right? Uh, is this stagnant, fearful middle class uh, that only wants to be protected, or can we go back uh, to a middle class projected in the future that wants dynamism more than uh, protection? And the only way we can do that is not through Twitter politicians. We can only follow the sentiment. Uh, you have to go back to ideas and think about solution, because it's clear that uh, uh, our citizens in the middle class uh, don't trust politics so much, don't trust the government, but they trust policy. They think that solution can be created. And in order for a solution to be created, you need to have places like this one or a research center and organization when practical and policy solution are given, even though they are not popular yet and not requested yet. And it's the economy, stupid, you mentioned at some point in the report, even if it's economics too. So even when uh, laymen and middle class people don't see that economics and policy is the solution to their problems, we have to force real leaders to refocus on those uh, instruments to solve problems and have a vibrant middle class, not a fearful one. Yeah. Thank you, Rosa Maria. And indeed, you have touched uh, maybe the central issue, which is, I mean, OK, this is the evidence. What do we do from here? Do we address the problem through reforms and dynamism or through intervention and protectionism. So I don't know if there will be a chance to come back to that later, I hope. But my suggestion is that since we are running out of time, I mean, it's a very substantial report, so it, it took some time to, to lay the ground for discussion. Um, uh, but I don't want you know, participants to be completely passive in this exercise. So I suggest that we can already open up uh, for questions and comments from the floor, if there is any. Otherwise, I will ask. I have 100 questions that I could ask myself. Um, but if there are questions already, I will uh, give some of you the floor. For the moment, I don't see any. And, uh, and therefore, I, I, I ask some of my own questions. Maybe, I mean, I start with you, Rosa Maria, I mean, following up directly on your, on your last uh, point. Um, 
I mean, my impression, I mean, if you, if you look for a moment at the side of policy makers, I have the impression that you also see a change, right? I mean, when I came to Brussels not so long ago, maybe 2015, something like this, the discourse was all about reforms, structural reforms, market access, growth. So the solution to the middle class problem, which was resented also then, um, seemed to be a market-based solution. The talk of the last few years has been protection and intervention, essentially. Um, yes, so my question to you is, how do you interpret this shift? How do you assess it? And uh, is it a problem? And uh, is a different approach possible? Okay, I think the two uh, uh, um, reasons to change the, discourse, the public discourse in Europe. Uh, one is the uh, rapid succession of crises. So you, when you're in a crisis, it's harder to think uh, in the long term, and reforms require you to think in the long term, because uh, usually reforms have costs that are immediate and benefits that are long term. They're already hard to do in a good policy cycle. They're very difficult to do in a crisis cycle. But as Anthony was pointing out, the way that the uh, EU showed it was very good at managing and learning from crisis, uh, I think affected the, the trust that people uh, will increasingly have uh, in how you can be the new tractor of new changes. And the other thing is the populistic bubble. And we will experience and seen in all European, most of European countries and abroad, the rise of these dichotomic and simplicistic movements. But I also have the feeling, and I hope it's not just a wishful thinking, that this bubble is imploding because they're either failing or transforming themselves. Uh, I'm from Italy, and this is, I think, uh, a very good example of uh, having a party that was elected with a strong populist anti-EU platform, and then coming to power and becoming perfectly EU confident and compatible and respectable and much more centered than right uh, that it was uh, when he got presented. Of course, sometimes they always have some moments of uh, craziness, but more or less is a traditional going. So once the uh, mm, populistic bubble keeps uh, imploding, and it will implode because it will not give solution to what people are asking. They're just doing the Twitter politics I was talking about. They just say, you want this? OK, we'll give you this. But then after four years, it doesn't work anymore, and they lose their content. So after that, and after hopefully you can exit the crisis solution mode, I hope reforms and long-term structural reforms go back to the main agenda. Thank you, Rosa Maria. Would you like to add anything, Anthony? Um, I, I, I would, and I, and I agree very much with, with what you said. And I had written the same thing about policy versus politics, unfortunately. And so that's a challenge, I think, for uh, political families. And I think there, one thing I would say is that I, I, I think that the European level does it better. At the European level, political families are used to working together. Um, in the European Parliament, for, 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 for many, many years, this has been uh, the case. And I think that is a very interesting phenomenon, where perhaps you have a far more reasonable discourse uh, among politicians and political families at a European level than you do at a national level. And that should not be underestimated. Of course, we know. The open question is what will happen following the next election and whether or not there will be a majority of uh, um, uh, politicians elected at a European level who may not be part of a, what I would describe as a very broad a mainstream of, of political parties uh, in uh, already at, at EU level, whether that's uh, the EPP, the S&D, Renew, Green, already uh, a pretty big uh, uh, spectrum uh, there. Um, as in the, it's customary in these moments, uh, I, I am going to pick up on something that I disagreed with um, in, the, in the study, and that was page nine when it said, second, despite all the emphasis placed on self-expression and quality of life in our post-materialistic age, ensuring economic and physical security actually remains the core of the middle class problem. I would contend that these are central to quality of life. Safety is central to your quality of life. Uh, your income is central to your quality of life. What we need to stop doing, though, is, is almost saying, being reductionist about things. It's complex. If you ask anyone what's most important in their lives, strip it all away. We come up with things that are very personal. 
but they are very, very important. Probably number one for most of us is going to be health, right? Why? Because if you're not around, you can't answer that question. If you're not healthy, forget most of the other stuff. Things like education are super important. And, you know, that sense of, of, of human satisfaction, which I don't think we should, we should underestimate. So I would just say, I would, I would caution about a sort of return to it's all about the, the economy, stupid. More than anything, because economics is a means to an end. Economics is not an end in itself. Good economics is supposed to generate the elements that can give you really good public services, really good public goods. So uh, I, I would just say that it's a very important thing to keep, keep that in mind. Thank you, Anthony. I believe Martin would like to add something on this. Absolutely. So what is really interesting to find is if, if you reflect on the pyramid of Maslow and the, and the findings from this study, um, I think the findings of this study uh, reveal that people want to flourish and to thrive. And that has to do with fulfilling their aspirations in life. And we also know from happiness research, for example, that being embedded in a social environment that is like your family and that is re reciprocal, uh, and, and that, um, uh, so this feeling of embeddedness is very important. It, it's a means to be able to thrive and fulfill even your mission in life. That's a longing, a deep longing of, of many people. And that is not necessarily self-actualization. And, and I think this is where we might have gone lost. Be, because um, your mission in life can be to take care of others and be a very good nurse or a very good teacher. And, and all these people are needed. And, um, um, and, and I think so building upon these personal drivers of people it is very important also to move beyond the current state of, of crisis. So I think um, also Christian democratic uh, policies and ideology is about uh, enabling people to do what they are good at in the community. And, and what we see reflected in these data is if, if there is too much focus on... Um, values that are often present amongst the, the creative segment in society, uh, which is um, highly educated, but also in a way detached from the lower strata of society, that is a danger in these times of crisis. We need a recalibration, and that's what uh, of connecting with the values of people also in the middle and the lower strata. So thank you for your question, your remark, and this is my uh, response. Thank you. And indeed, these are points that we make even more forcefully, I think, in the previous report, which is still, I mean, the data are a little bit outdated, but the basic infrastructure is still very interesting, I think, if some of you want to have a look. I believe there is a question from the floor already. Owen. Thank you. Um, I'm Regina Maroncelli. I am the president of the Large Families Confederation, the European Large Families Confederation. Uh, thank you for this uh, study. It's very interesting. Um, I'm sorry I lost the beginning, but I, I think uh, I had very, very interesting hints uh, I would like to share with you. Um, because when you are talking about uh, the shrinking of the middle class, uh, it comes very natural to me about thinking how also large families uh, is a phenomenon that is shrinking. And uh, large families used to be a very common uh, model, family model in uh, middle class, which is not now. Uh, but um, this is um, all the things you said uh, seems very much linked to uh, demography topics and issues we are facing now. And when you talk about the stagnation of the middle class, I think about uh, the general situation of the stagnation of society and uh, uh, the general fear of having children, uh, having um, uh, the same concerns like uh, not having a house, not having uh, the exact uh, wage that we, you should have um, due to your um, studies and so on. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if you have ever uh, 
done this uh, uh, connection between natality um, and demography in, uh, altogether. And uh, uh, when you come to the solutions, uh, you are talking about cooperation, safety, solidarity, stability, justice, and freedom. And I read the family. Um, of course, is my is my topic, so I read it everywhere. Uh, but maybe um, if we start to to, to see all these um, phenomena uh, with a family friendly perspective, uh, this could help uh, um, to um, to face real problems of people. Uh, I mean, uh, it was market before. It was uh, maybe now is the safety. Uh, but also is family, um, something that is very deep, very profound, and, and very meaningful for the middle class, I think. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I think that's a relevant, indeed, remark. And, um, well, I don't think anybody will disagree with you in Christian democratic circles on the importance of family-friendly policies, but specifically on uh, how does this bear on the middle class problem and uh, whether we test it for it and its role in the study. Maybe I give the floor to... Martijn. Sure, so um, civil society comes out as um, one of the main actors that people expect solutions from. And clearly family is, is an important part of that, absolutely. Um, and this sense of reciprocity that people are longing for, where do you learn that? It's in the family. But I think it's, it's needed to, the, yeah, we need to readjust it to the current uh, situation and the, the, the current circumstances. Um, so, yeah, we, we didn't touch upon it very much in this report. It's an interesting avenue for analysis. I think it's also clear from the analysis that uh, views are very diverse on what then family means in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, but there is, I think, a lot of common ground because from other research we see that one of the highest values that are present amongst liberals and conservatives that have, even have the potential to help us overcome polarization, it is a focus on compassion, a focus on caring, and that is what many people are longing for in these times that are yeah, experienced as, as very violent and, and, uh, and regressive. So I think that there is uh, uh, an avenue to explore further in, in all diversity. Rosa Maria? I just want to add uh, a couple of words on this uh, as a person who is thinking about if to enlarge our family personally. So I think it goes back uh, partially to policies and economics, but again, it's also a way of self-definition. A stagnant middle class is too fearful to have more children. And you don't have more than one, more than two, more than three if you don't have faith in the future, faith that the future market will be able to provide for them and give them opportunities. So uh, certainly there are policies in, more, in some countries more than the others uh, that need to be accommodated to allow for uh, a better uh, work-life balance or at least some work with a, with a, with a family. Uh, but again, it's also and very much a cultural uh, issue about hope in the future that somehow the middle class is losing by focusing too much on protection and less on growth. Thank you, Rosa Maria. I have already three questions from the floor, so I will start from Owen here. Uh, thanks, Federico, and uh, thanks to the speakers for some um, excellent analysis. Um, I just have a comment and a question. I think the, the comment is that um, given the kind of areas that are identified as important in terms of solutions that, you know, we shouldn't forget that um, the, main, um, the main part of how this change will occur is at a national le level, given where competencies are at the moment. Um, so, and that brings back the importance of, uh, you know, centre-right parties at a national level. Because if you think about taxation, if you think about, you know, education, health, housing, childcare, all fundamentally uh, national level issues. But they are all also traditional EPP uh, priorities, centre-right priorities over the years. 
And I think it's very important that when we think about taxation, we need to reduce taxation on income. I think according to the OECD, 5% of European taxation income comes from housing, even though housing is disproportionately owned by the older generations and is disproportionately the main driver of wealth. Um, unfortunately for a lot of EPP parties, particularly in Western Europe, I would say probably the Netherlands is a good example, uh, centre-right parties can become associated with protecting the interests of the older generations, rather than, as Rosa Maria said, putting in place something that the younger generations um, can aspire to. I think, you know, a lot of it is getting back to basics. It's about providing uh, middle-class families, whatever shape those families take, about, um, you know, having a kind of uh, a platform where their children can have you know, a higher quality of life, a higher standard of living than their parents have. And certainly in countries like, like Italy and in other countries, that, that is not the case for a lot of middle class families in terms of employment opportunities, etc. cetera. Um, so my question, uh, I just have one question then for um, Martine in particular uh, in the Netherlands, because the Netherlands is a very interesting example, is that you know, we've recently seen the emergence of a couple of new parties in the Netherlands which have the roots in Christian democracy, or at least, you know, in the centre-right parties. And I'm thinking particularly of the, the new party of um, Omzeit, or uh, the, the new social, social contract party. And anything I've read about that is that, um, you know, why people, why he's at 18% in the polls, why people think they will vote for him, is because of the importance of personal integrity and values. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how that is important because the EPP in many states, we have not been, you know, um, we don't always have our hands clean when it, come, when it comes to that, particularly in the larger member states where we're doing um, not so well at the moment. So just, just a, a question really about how important um, our personal values in terms of leading, you know, uh, centre-right-ish uh, parties into the next election. Thanks. Thanks, Owen. I have four questions from the floor, so I suggest that we take them in pairs. So, Panos, please. Thanks, Veda. Thank you very much to all of you being here and for the presentation. I just have very short questions for Martin. Uh, I think that uh, in your presentation you said that uh, basically the solidarity towards the Ukraine uh, from specific states in the European Union are, is focused mainly on Southeast Europe. Uh, but looking at the maps, I see that in reality it's much more widespread and especially in Central Europe. And you mentioned historical reasons and orthodoxy. I have the impression that it's not the only reason. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more what is the reason why in Central European countries this, uh, the, the, this feeling against, uh, against Russia uh, prevails? And the second is about uh, the last point concerning traditionalists and creatives. You mentioned that because of some countries' uh, tendency to traditionalism, these countries tend also to support Uc uh, Russia or not to be very sympathetic uh, towards Ukraine. But looking again at the map, I see that traditionalists uh, uh, disperse from Cyprus, Greece, towards, uh, towards Portugal. And when creatives, for example, Greece or Romania, are again uh, score very high. So I don't see very much the correlation also to that. Can you please elaborate? Thank you, Panos. So, Martin, if, uh, or sure, Panos, if you would like to... So regarding the segments of the traditionalists and creatives, we see two situations. Just speak in Some countries case. have a lot of traditionalists, very few creatives. Some countries have both at the same time, like Greece. It's more polarized in this regard. Now, Portugal, for instance, is much, uh, it's much less moderated. Now, historical ties play, do play a role. You read it in the news and articles. I don't know, you read the Greek press, probably what people think, why they favor one side or the other. So they do play a role to some extent, but it's also a combination of factors. You also see uh, country-specific things like cost of living, corruption. So people might associate one or the other side with an improvement in this regard. So I think we really should look on country-by-country -country basis to form, to draw conclusions. 
Uh, do you want to address also uh, Owen's question on the Netherlands, or maybe that uh, Martijn might? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so the, the party of Peter Omzicht please for like a new social contract, and he indeed originates from the CDA, uh, the Christian Democratic Party, um, and he is putting forward many of the topics that we cover in this report, actually, uh, because it's it's about um, the. Um, uh, yeah, security of living, of finances. Uh, so so he, he is pleading for um, noblesse oblige, so, so a new social contract between elites and the population. And that resonates very much with what we see in these data. So, um, yeah, and I think the, the, the notion of personal integrity is, of course, vital to all of this. If we do, we have also some research on, on trust in leadership. Um, and th this has to do with the combination of being in these times, uh, also have, having a vision, but also personal integrity and being able to, to execute. Um, and there, yeah, the history of the, the, the Christian Democratic Party uh, might also be like a burden. Um, so, so I think the learning from this is that there is a lot of demand in the, in the population for center-right policies and values, and that needs to be embodied also by new generations of leaders, and I think that's an, a huge potential for, for the Christian democratic family. And if you don't embody that, then it's, yeah, it, your competitors will, will take that on. So let's, let's learn from that. Thanks, Martijn. I believe Anthony would like to add something. Yep, uh, quickly. Um, I, I think one thing, and it was picking up on, on, on the question, and you know, how is it possible that you've got creatives and you've got traditionalists? And um, one, one problem you have is when you visualize something with maps uh, linked to nation states. Um, because you essentially have to aggregate what happens inside a territory. Um, but if you were to map uh, the northern part of Italy uh, with um, the zones in uh, clo close countries, you might find quite a lot of uh, communality of view relative to other parts. So, what, and, and this speaks also to what Federico was saying earlier about the need for sophistication. Now, it can be at national, or it can be a, a lot more sophisticated. You could, I, I think something that would be fascinating would be to generate a map with, with no boundaries, with no nation state boundaries, just like an EU map, and use color coding for where creatives lie. Example, I don't know off the top of my head, Lisbon, massive creative hub, right? And then compare that to uh, Alentejo, um, which is agricultural, rural, etc. And I think there what we would see is that it's not necessarily a question just of national. It's a question of, 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 of the territory of the EU, and the territory of the EU has many areas that have commonalities in different places. And so you have traditionalists probably in every country in, in different pockets, and some of them may be right next to ones in other, in other countries. And I think that's super interesting when you are thinking EU, when you're not thinking uh, uh, national necessarily. And one, one thing we were discussing uh, in a paper that I think uh, Owen is about to publish um, very soon on agriculture is the difference between rural communities and urban communities. So within our, uh, our countries, there are big differences um, just by going from you know, one metropolis, say, to uh, an, another uh, zone. So this can happen between countries, although there I think one would have to look at it very carefully as well, but it can also happen within countries. And so it gets you into 2D and 3D. It can be quite fun, quite interesting, and, and the potential, if you like, readings of that are, would be fascinating. Thanks, Anthony. I can only reinforce the point. Actually, we have regional data, and there, was, there were discussions at the beginning whether we should display them aggregated nationally or regionally. We opted for this, but we have the data, and indeed, uh, if you visualize them in that way, it's, it's a whole different picture, and it's very interesting. 
Um, I have two more questions. I will take them because the gentlemen have been raising their hands for a long time. I would just ask you to be brief because we are running a bit out of time. So Tommy and the gentleman next to you. Okay, because of time, I'd keep it very. Actually, it's just a short comment about this demo because I, I comment on it because there was two two notes on that. It's demographic change and this aging. Is uh, uh, my point would be to say that that indeed there's a very strong economic component and also security about future and all that. But there is, I think, we should be honest. There is also, you know, uh, value slash opportunity cost dimension there, meaning that uh, that that uh, you know, young people, even studies show there is things which didn't happen 20, 30 years ago. But you know, the young people are questioning: Do I want to get married? Do I want to have children at uh, at all? And and where where you know the comp the reason is. And studies show this. It's not always economics or security, but it is the opportunity cost. People are, you know, seeing investment to family versus other opportunities. What the current, you know, the current society provides. But just a comment, no question. Tommy, the gentleman over there. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, Can you please turn on the mic and speak? Uh, Testing. Yeah. All right. Uh, so my question would be, um, from the report, th th there has been noted a, a great trust in, um, in the EU as an institution. Uh, and uh, from that, in the policy recommendations, it's sort of uh, been established that, uh, that central European action and, and uh, sort of a political integration is sort of a medicine to, to a lot of the problems that has been um, presented in the report. And my question would be, um, I, when I when I looked over this uh, now, I couldn't find any data on um, on the middle classes um, reaction or trust in European integration in itself as a pro as a project. And and uh, uh, I was wondering if, if there's any data on that or if you have any comments about that. Uh, look. Uh it is an issue that we have covered rather extensively, actually, in the previous report, much more. Uh, it is true that the, the impression you get from this report is that we are advocating more Europe across the board. But if you look at the previous report, you will see, actually, that it's a much more nuanced argument that we are making and that we have been making for years. It's, it's in a way, a stronger Europe in some fields where there is a real added value in EU action, defense, foreign policy, border controls, but also a much stronger protection of diversity and national differentiation and regional differentiation in other areas where citizens clearly don't want centralization. And Martin was, was pointing out some of these areas. For example, you know, moral disagreements. This is an area where there is a tendency to centralize at the EU level. We think the tendency is wrong. And we, I think we showed with data that citizens too think that that tendency is wrong. So there, there should be, of course, it's not easy to, to find the right balance. Because for example, if you test uh, people's support for the rule of law, including in Hungary and Poland, it's extremely strong. But then when you start dissecting what the rule of law means and you ask people, but what about, I mean, okay, is it the independence of the judiciary from the executive or is it gay marriage? Then you start seeing, you know, no people say gay marriage. I'm against because there is tradition. There are traditionalists in these countries. So when we, when Martin was saying you, we need to take diversity seriously, again, that's a point that we make more extensively in the previous study. It means that you cannot rule a, a, a supranational union of diverse peoples. Uh, with a very centralized, for example, moral agenda. I mean, even the United States says the death penalty in some states and not in others. Why should Europe, for example, ban abortion at the federal level? Or, or you know, you see what I mean? So I, I think it's a much more nuanced argument that we are making, but it is true that in this study, you have the feeling that it's much more uh, uh, in support of centralization. I don't, I don't know if anybody else wants to add something. Otherwise, I will, yeah. Very quickly. Um, do you know, look, I, I've, I stepped away from the EU for, for, for many years. I was right, always followed it incredibly closely. But look, sometimes when people talk about the things that people talk about in Brussels for years on end, you know, um, PESC, you know, the uh, foreign policy and security and integration and all these, all these concepts that mean stuff to us here in this bubble, you talk about European integration to someone, I don't know, you go down to a pub in Sweden and they go, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. If you then say to them, do you think it's a good idea for a, you know, that vaccine thing where we all got that vaccine together? Yeah. 
as in concrete. I think it has to be concrete. It's not about theology and philosophy. When you look at the needs that Europe has and who can deliver them, at what level they can best be delivered, subsidiarity goes up and down, not just down. Because in my, in my sense, subsidiarity was all about, oh God, it's far too much in Brussels, it's got to be, it's got to be uh, done elsewhere. Just call it as you see it and see what can be delivered. And I think what, what's happened is that at a European level, there have been quick solutions to headaches that nobody wanted to grapple with nationally. And they couldn't grapple with it nationally. I don't think they were, fan they were you know, head over heels to do this stuff in Brussels, you know, because the risk is you get it wrong in Brussels, they'll punish you 10 times more than if you get it wrong uh, nationally or, or, or locally. Call it as you see it. Then it's not about philosophy and integration and the rest. That follows. It's basically, well, how do you get this done efficiently? Because maybe you need a system that's more efficient than one person get, puts the hand up and vetoes it. Do you think that would be a great way for us to make a decision in this room if we had to do it quick? No. So I think we're there we just have to be pragmatic and practical and less theological. That would be my um, suggestion so that we don't get ourselves wrapped up. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this would open a whole new uh, discussion which would passionate me very much because this is my main area of interest. The middle class expert here is actually Owen Dre uh, over there. Um, but we cannot go into that now. So let's wrap it up. I would like to thank the speakers for, for a very insightful, I think, and uh, in-depth discussion. I would like to thank all of you for being present for your uh, contribution. Uh, I will leave you just with a couple of messages. First of all, I think we have asserted that there is a crisis, that it is a huge challenge, but I think we were also, we also, also offered um, uh, some hope. Uh, there, is, uh, there are opportunities for action both from the EU and from the EPP, and knowing this, you know, at the eve of an important European elections, I think it's helpful. It's helpful to the political family, it's helpful to the general public at large. Um, second message, also building on the last uh, short discussion, we need to take diversity seriously, undeniably, and it's one of the underlying messages of both uh, surveys that we have done in um, uh, last year and this year. And maybe the last maybe point, uh, it is not the first work that we do on the middle classes. It is maybe the most ambitious, but we have done, I think, maybe half a dozen at least uh, Owen uh, papers we have published on the middle classes already, so it won't be the last one. So if you're interested in the topic, stay tuned and you will see more material um, being published in the next month and years. Thank you very much and you can now enjoy uh, lunch next door. Thank you.